to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. Later, as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. O Lord, open our eyes to behold your glory, open our ears to hear your word. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. There was a journalist photographer who got caught out in the, out in the rain in a downpour and he was looking for possible shelter, and he saw this rather dark, gloomy house, but he thought it could at least keep the rain off. So while he was drying off in the house, he heard scary sounds and was quite startled to see a ghost coming towards him. Well, he grabbed his camera to take pictures, and the ghost asked him what he was doing. So he said, well, I just want to take your picture for the newspaper. Well, the ghost was glad for the exposure, and posed for the photographer, and when his film was finished, he thanked the ghost and rushed to his office to get the film developed. When he saw the results, though, he was terribly disappointed. They all came out black. They were all underexposed. And the moral of the story is, the spirit was willing, but the flash was weak. <laughs> Today's joke is in honor of my father, who enjoys a good pun that induces good groans. Well, these days, everyone's a photographer. We only need to look online to see how many people are taking selfies. Are you familiar with what a selfie is? Taking out their phones and taking pictures of themselves with different people in different places. People cataloging their trips or maybe even showing off their latest culinary masterpiece. I don't know, apparently we all want to know what everybody eats every day and have to pull <laughs> pictures of them and post them online. And uh, there just seems to be this um, a plethora of pictures being taken over and over again and so that everyone, all their friends and acquaintances can see them as well. Now I think there are a few pitfalls to this uh, growing phenomenon. The first is that I have a theory that all these billions of photos and videos being posted online will one day break the internet. One day the internet's just going to shut down because there's just so much stuff being thrown on there. Or at least in the least, I think future historians that try to catalog and organize the information from this era uh, will pull their hair out with all these crazy selfies and pictures being taken and posted online. Other more serious uh, pitfalls of this practice is that um, I've actually known people who have been fired from their jobs or who weren't hired in the first place for their jobs due to the photos they'd posted online in their Facebook uh, account. They presented themselves in some way and their employer or would-be employer found it out and elected not to hire them or even to fire them. Another danger that's been well documented in the news today is uh, what's happening out east with cyberbullying. We know of the School of Dentistry, but also a local high school in, in Nova Scotia. It became very publicized when uh, youth take incriminating pictures of others and then post them online in order to embarrass and ridicule them. So given all these potential uh, dangers, why are people so driven to take all these pictures? What's this fascination we all have to wanting to have visual recordings and documentation of our lives. I think some of it can be deduced from the way we talk about photography as capturing the moment. Capturing the moment. 
Now, at its most innocuous, this simply means having a memento of a trip or a significant event to help one remember it in the future. But implied in that phrase is the idea that we can take control of a time or experience by taking a picture of it. We are capturing it, freezing it in time, and can choose to return to it whenever we wish. And I think there's benefits to this, but there's also a danger. Because we humans have the propensity to romanticize the past. We can take a picture and the memories associated with it and make it mean whatever we wish it to mean. For people in the practice of posting photos online, we can use pictures as a way of presenting only the parts of ourselves that we wish others to see. We look for comments on our photos, especially ones praising just how good we look in that photo. <laughs> and we use other people's images to get to know them. Settling for a snapshot of a fraction of who that person actually is. Something like this is taking place in our gospel today. Peter, James, and John are blessed with this visionary experience of Christ. And he appears before them in a brilliant white glory. Then Moses and Elijah appear. And Peter wishes to preserve the experience by offering to make dwellings for all three. In a sense, Peter is trying to take a picture of the moment. He wishes to capture it, prolong it, because he doesn't really know how to make sense of it. Now, readers of Mark's gospel would be wise to pick up the cues the author provides in advance of this particular moment. Earlier, Jesus restores the sight of a blind man at Bethsaida so that he can see things clearly, Mark says. Nearly every significant event in Mark's gospel is preceded by a story of Jesus healing a blind person. It's as if Mark is telling his audience, all you blind people out there, all you blind readers, look and see what's about to happen next. Now, immediately following this, Peter is able to confess Jesus as Lord and Messiah, as the Son of God. And this is the title attributed to Jesus that connotes his glory, authority, and kingship. But now Peter's understanding of Jesus is being taken further. Jesus is transfigured, pictured in all his glory. And the disciples see, seeing Jesus with Moses who represents the law, and Elijah, who represents the prophets, wish to fit Jesus into familiar categories. But a cloud overshadows them, and a loud voice declares to them, This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Now their eyes were opened to perceive Christ in his glory, but implied in this message is that their ears didn't want to hear what Jesus was telling them. What were they always resistant to hearing from Jesus? Just earlier, we have one of these instances where Peter refused to accept the idea that Jesus would have to suffer and die for the sins of humanity. Peter just couldn't accept it. He didn't understand why the Son of God couldn't find a more pleasant solution to the depraved human condition. If Jesus could heal the sick with only a touch, couldn't he perform some miracle that negated the need for his or their suffering? Well, at the end of today's story, Jesus sternly tells the disciples to say nothing about what had happened. Mark concludes until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Peter, James, and John were caught up in an extraordinary moment, and they wished to capture that moment, but it eluded them. Something greater was afoot that would only make sense in light of Christ's death and resurrection. And we recall that Mark designed his gospel this way, to rush through the gospel, to get to the end, to read it all over again in light 
of Christ's death and resurrection. Because it's always pointing to something more is about to happen. Something monumental, something significant. A moment where they would come to understand more about their Lord. Now I think we all have pretty limited understandings about Jesus, about God, about the nature of reality. And like the disciples, we might be quick to embrace the spectacular manifestations of God, the times when our faith services our need for comfort, love, and community. But what about this thing that has to do with Jesus as the Son of Man? And we recall that title referring to the Old Testament figure of the suffering servant. One who would suffer, one who would be broken. What about that? How is God's face shown to us in suffering? What is that Jesus like? In Rob Bell's book, Velvet Elvis, Repainting the Christian Faith, the author talks about his early understandings of Elvis Presley. How many of you have a Velvet Elvis painting at home? <laughs> Confession time. <laughs> Maybe a few. Well, Rob Bell talks about how as a child, um, growing up and visiting his grandparents' house, he was quite fascinated by this Velvet Elvis painting in his in, in the basement. And he was fascinated by it, and he came to believe that that was Elvis. And he didn't know anything different. He didn't know anything other than that. And he believed that this Velvet Elvis painting referred or uh, uh, accurately depicted Jesus. He uses that image to talk about the Christian faith. And how many of us Christians, perhaps even those of us who've grown up in church all our lives, tend to have a particular image of Jesus that we hold in our minds that may actually be a little more comparable to the Velvet Elvis. But it, there's something to it that looks like the real thing, but we're missing something. There's something more to Jesus than maybe we really know, that we understand. And Rob Bell goes on to talk about these stories of, of, of experiencing that, that something more in, in his life, in his encounters with people. Something about the Son of Man that shows us glory and holiness in periods and times of great pain and suffering. He writes this, I went to a funeral service several years ago and walked into the lobby of the chapel and immediately thought I was the only one there. Then I realized I wasn't the first one. The husband of the woman who had died was there, standing over the open casket. I walked over to him as he stood over her body, put my arm around him, and didn't say anything. Just the two of us in this big open room looking down at his wife's body. He just kept saying over and over, she was such a good woman. She was such a good woman. And we stood there together for a while with my arm around his shoulder. And I listened to him repeat, she was such a good woman. The ground was holy. He goes on to say, because it isn't just those beautiful moments in the midst of, of the everyday and mundane. It is also in the tragic and gut-wrenching moments when we cannot escape the simple fact that there is way more going on around us than we realize. Can you identify times that you have been able to see and perceive the holiness of God in the face of great suffering and pain. I related to Raoul Bell's story a little bit. I thought immediately of an instance in my first parish where a gentleman was very near death. And his wife was an active member of the church and her mother and uh, daughter were both uh, uh, every Sunday attenders and they had, I had been with them through this time. They were experiencing horrible things during this period in their, in, their, in their life. One family member was murdered during this time. And now this fellow was very near death. 
And I remember being with them. They called me early that morning and I went to the hospital and we all gathered in his room. And I took his hand and we formed a circle all around him. And I said some prayers for us and then had us close that time together by saying the Lord's Prayer. And as we prayed the Lord's Prayer, he breathed his last breath. Amidst the tears and the grief, the sorrow, even the anger, we could all sense very clearly God's presence. There was a holiness to that moment. There was something of God being experienced in all of us in the face of this great ordeal. <clears throat> this is the Christ pattern evidenced throughout the universe. Glory in the face of suffering. Pain and healing intersecting. Death and resurrection. The transfiguration reminds us that we cannot capture Christ. He is, like C.S. Lewis's character Aslan, not a tame lion. The images we have of Christ never quite suffice, no matter how beautiful they are. But we are called to have open eyes and open ears, and to hear and heed Christ's invitation to follow him up the mountain, down into the ordinary of life, and on towards Jerusalem. Let us pray. Light of the world, illuminate our hearts and minds to perceive your glory your holiness in the good things we experience in life in the ordinary things we experience but especially in the difficult times as we move into the season of Lent may we cling to you ever more nearly may our faith and our resolve be strengthened to walk with you on that path towards Jerusalem towards her suffering and death. And may we find in that journey healing and hope for ourselves, our loved ones, and this world. Amen. Amen.